Good evening. Welcome to our webinar on preventing underage drinking. I'm Brian McCready representing the Clackamas County Prevention Coalition, and I'm honored to introduce our guests to this important discussion. First, let's start with a brief overview of what you can expect tonight. We'll begin with some logistics to ensure our webinar runs smoothly. Please note that all attendees will be muted and off screen and the chat feature will be disabled. However, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions throughout the presentation. During the webinar, presenters will explore effective strategies for empowering young people to make positive choices, identifying when to seek help, and understanding the societal influences that contribute to underage drinking and other substance use. <clears throat> and please introduce our speakers today, Dr. Seppala, Dr. Loeffler, and Mayor Joe Buck. Marvin Seppala, MD, is an addiction psychiatrist who does private practice, forensic work, and some consulting. He is an international speaker on issues of addiction and recovery. Dr. Seppala was chief medical officer at Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation for over two decades, retiring in December of 21. He is an adjunct assistant professor at Hazelden Betty Ford Graduate School of Addiction Studies and an adjunct assistant professor of psychiatry at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. He is currently on the board of directors of 4D Recovery. Dr. Seppel obtained his MD at Mayo Clinic Mayo Medical School in Rochester, Minnesota, served as psychiatry residency and addict Addiction Fellowship at the University of Minnesota Hospitals in Minneapolis. Dr. Seppala has testified before Congress and appeared as a guest on CBS's The Early Show, CNN, and the National Public Radio, among many other broadcast news outlets. He's also been quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, Newsweek, and the Wall Street Journal. He is an author of Clinician's Guide to 12-Step Principles, and co-author of When, Pain Kill when Painkillers Become Dangerous, Pain-Free Living for Drug-Free People and Prescription Painkillers. Moxie Loeffler is an osteopathic physician who is dual board certified in addiction and internal medicine. She is the Oregon Medical Director for the Community Medical Services, CMS, and Opioid Treatment Program. She studied ethics and literature and obtained her bachelor's of arts at Sarah Lawrence College. And she planned to become an ethics professor before deciding to become a doctor. She worked in nutrition and natural products research and development for five years while volunteering at a syringe exchange program and as a suicide prevention and crisis response counselor. She then completed her doctor of osteopathic medicine degree at Toro University College in, of Osteopathic Medicine, California in 2009. She completed a comp, combined internal medicine MPH residency program at Kaiser Oakland Medical Center and the University of California, Berkeley. Her interdisciplinary MPH program focused on health equity and environmental health. Dr. Loeffler views health and disease as processes that occur in environmental landscapes shaped by policy. She is the past president 2020-2021 and public policy chair of the universe of the Oregon Society of Addiction Medicine. She is studying to become a Buddhist lay priest and she enjoys running, swimming and cycling. She lives with her husband and children in Eugene, Oregon. Joe Buck was elected mayor of Lake Oswego in 2020 and previously served a four-year term on the city council. He is actively engaged with community organizations working to make his hometown a welcoming and safe place of belonging for all. Mayor Buck's areas of leadership focus include youth engagement, sustainability, health and wellness, and affordable housing. Professionally, he owns and operates several local restaurants, as the third generation owner of Lake Oswego's oldest eatery, hospitality is in his genes. He is a US Coast Guard veteran and studied business administration and accounting at the University of Portland. 
Joe Buck will start us off, followed by Dr. Seppala and Dr. Loeffler. Each speaker has finished addressing has finished addressing questions from the audience. After each speaker has a finished addressing questions from the audience, Joe will ask them additional questions to spark additional discussion. At the end of the webinar, we will provide a list of local resources. Please note this webinar will be recorded and posted on Clackamas County's YouTube website, Clackco TV. With that being said, I will pass it on now to our first presenter, Joe Buck. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate the introductions and I really appreciate all of you uh, taking the time to be here this evening to engage on this uh, important topic and to uh, Drs. Loeffler and Seppala, who have you know dedicated their life to this uh, imp important work, and brought um, their um, their talents to the uh, to the stage here. Um, so I'm uh, I feel like the odd duck out <laughs> in this conversation, um, but it's an honor to be able to speak before you. Um, come with lots of lived uh, experiences. Um, you know, well as, as the mayor of Lake Oswego, but um, more importantly here tonight, someone who's um, living in recovery from uh, long-term recovery from from alcoholism. Um, it wasn't until somewhat recently that I even started speaking publicly um, about uh, living in, in in recovery and what that has meant to me, and um, um, and 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 speaking out on various public policies and whatnot, um, starting to advocate for change uh, with, with within our uh, within our communities. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about my personal story uh, here uh, tonight um, and um, uh, hope that it may re resonate uh, with some of you out there. Um, so I, I really never knew that um, alcoholism was a, a disease until I was in a recovery from it. Uh, all of my life, I'd been in a condition to view it as a, a personal failing, um, something that was very you know shameful and that uh, should be kept uh, secret. And that was kind of part, part of the... Um, um, the problem. Uh, I uh, once I became sober, I knew that, uh, learned that there was a large sober community that has existed, you know, all this time, um, but just so far in the in the shadows that I had no idea uh, th th that it was there. Um, as you know, Brian mentioned, I grew up in uh, uh, in in the restaurant business, so you know, in around around bars and um, drinking and and just immersed in 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 that culture. Um, for me personally, with with my family, even though um, uh, alcoholism is a part of our history, it was just something that we never talked about. Um, you know, dark kind of family secret um, type things. It just was something that that wasn't addressed. Um, so as a as a as a kid, uh, an adolescent, as a teen growing up, I mean, I even the concept of someone who didn't drink because I it was something that would have been foreign to me. Um, I couldn't name, you know, one sober adult, um, and, and, and wouldn't have even thought about it, but I knew that they were all around me. And, and it wasn't until I was, uh, in, in recovery that I started to, uh, that I started to, to meet them, including, um, um, well, I don't get <laughs> too personally here on this, uh, recorded, uh, you know, on, on the recorded video, but there were just people really close to me who were around me my entire life, um, who, um, lived uh, in in recovery and i and and never talked about it until you know we had that connection uh, together as 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 um sober people um so i you know uh grew up probably if many of you on this webinar are parents grew up like many of your kids i grew up here in the uh, lake oswego community um you know was a, a, a had a very loving family um a great education um and uh, never, ever dreamed that I would get, you know, mixed up in, um, in, 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 in drinking or go down a path, path of alcoholism. Um, but um, that's exactly, you know, what happened uh, shortly after I, you know, left for uh, college and then, you know, joined the, the military. I was just immersed in, 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 in a drinking culture. It was really all around me. And, you know, uh, the moment I, I realized that things were off, was when I uh, returned home. Uh, I was on on leave from the Coast Guard, and I, I returned home. And you know, my parents were having a birthday celebration or something for one of them. And they said, "Oh, Joe, what would you, you know?" And and I had turned twenty one over this period of time. And they said, "Well, what you know? What would you like to to What do you like to drink?" And I said, "Oh, I like to drink uh, vodka." And they said, "Oh, well, we'll get a, a bottle of vodka." They were more like wine drinkers. 
And so they got this, you know, fifth of vodka and they put it in, in the cabinet and we had the party and, you know, I went about drinking like I would normally do in the, in the coast guard and, and, and all was fine. And the next day, uh, I go downstairs and, and, uh, my mom's got the fifth of vodka, which was basically empty at that point. And she's like, what happened here? And did you, you know, did you consume all of this? And I said, oh yeah. Like, you know, what's the, what's the problem? I would just had no, and she was, uh, in, in utter disbelief. I mean, she did not know how I was alive, how I had survived the night. Um, but for me, I actually thought it was a light night. Um, and that's, I mean, they were so concerned seeing the looks on their faces. I thought, oh, well, wow, maybe this isn't uh, normal behavior. Um, but in the military, it was just so common. There was just no, no other perspective, no other voice. Um, that level of extremely heavy drinking um, was, was what took place. And, and I didn't know anything, know any better. And I continued the behavior for, um, some years, uh, thereafter. And it was really, uh, only with, um, the support of my family and my friends, um, people who really cared about me. Um, by that time, you know, I could keep kind of that secret, if you will, uh, for some time, you know, functioning well and, and all of that, um, going to school, um, but at some point, you know, the, um, it's, you know, the, 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 the game is up and, um, I could not hide it from anyone in my life anymore and, um, was able to get sober with, uh, their support and with, uh, treatment, uh, Hazel and Betty Ford, um, was a, you know, a wonderful place. And I was honestly extremely fortunate, you know, to have a family that had the resources, uh, to provide, um, that kind of treatment. And I, you know, think all the time about what would happen if I, you know, did not, if we did not have those, those resources where I would be, um, uh, today. Cause I know that's the case for just far too many, um, uh, far too many in, 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 in Oregon and, um, uh, nationwide. So, you know, I reflect on this often knowing that as a, as a, as a kid growing up, I just did not have any of these, um, any other perspective other than the, it's normal to drink. This is just what we do in a society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've really, um, made a point of speaking out more often, um, especially with, uh, youth that are engaged with the city and know that, you know, there's, there's many different ways, um, to, uh, to, to live, um, to take care of yourself and um, alcohol is, you know, something that's out there. I mean, we're, I think, we're pretty good. I, at least growing up, the I, I would never touch any other kind of drug. They really put the fear of God into me about literally any, anything else. But, you know, alcohol as a society is just, um, uh, you know, quite different. Um, and I think early sobriety, especially so for for young people, um, I got sober at a, at a very young young age, um, and it was extremely difficult. Um, the the peer pressure I faced, lots of questioning, you know, at the time, you know, as a person like dating people and things, it was just awful. Um, so many questions, you know, why aren't you drinking? Why don't you drink? Um, you know, really every, every time. So social interactions were very awkward, but as I've gotten a little bit older, I mean, that really dissipates quite a bit. I mean, so many people I know now, um, are, are sober and, um, it seems like folks are more aware too. And, um, you know, don't ask those, those, uh, same questions, but our society and really our state is, is intertwined in this crazy dependent relationship, um, with, with alcohol. And it's very, uh, powerful, um, as a state, you know, Oregon, we make a lot of money off the sale of uh, liquor, and our state spends our tax dollars to promote the, the sale of, of alcohol, even as we face um, uh, an addiction crisis. Um, alcohol and, uh, you know, I mean, you know, drug use in, in general, I mean, there's leading causes of uh, preventable death, and they just cost an immense amount of money annually, and it's just destroying lives and uh, families. Uh, somewhat recently, uh, Oregon Health Authority, they launched a great um, ad campaign, an award-winning uh, ad campaign called the Rethink the, the 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 Drink. And when I saw this campaign, I thought, wow, this is just incredible, really good just to, you know, provide a different perspective. And um, that ad campaign drew a lot of criticism from uh, Oregon's wine industry and then actually uh, received pushback um, from um, uh, uh, Oregon uh, folks in, in the legislature. And, uh, you know, that's really 
representative of what we see here when whenever we've tried to put efforts forth to uh, uh, create funding for more uh, prevention for treatment um, policies in place you know to address uh, drinking uh, there's the the knee jerk in Oregon is is you know somewhat for for uh, for for pushback uh, alcohol industry has a lot of uh, lobbyists I'm in the restaurant business. I mean, we make money off the sale of liquor, and over the over the years, of course, we've we've evolved too. And I'm um, glad to see a generation of people coming up now uh, who don't always uh, 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 prioritize drinking. Um, we see restaurants nationally and globally that have created a whole non-alcoholic uh, menus. It's just such a big thing now, and I love seeing that. It's just something that never existed uh, before. Uh, the whole zero proof movement is a is a big deal in a growing industry itself, and so it's good to see them um, getting some power because that will help affect change um, as 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 well. Um, but again, back in Oregon, just to, in terms of the the um, um, uh, pushback, even to adding a person with a background in um, substance abuse uh, prevention to the OLCC uh, board, which would be a great thing, the Oregon Liquor uh, Control uh, Commission. Um, uh, all these things, you know, are, have just been sensitive issues in, in in Oregon. So it's, again, great to see you all here uh, tonight engaging on this important topic, hopefully uh, learning a, a, a great deal from the professionals um, that, that that we have here. And I appreciate you all listening uh, to me as I, you know, share my story. As I said, we keep sobriety kind of a, we tend to keep it a secret and it's really not helping anyone. Um, so when when people hear from their community members that they too uh, suffer from addiction, and whether that's their teachers, parents, um, uh, their friends' parents, you know, coaches, peers, community leaders, um, that that they have the ability to speak out. I think that's something uh, really powerful, and something that more people are doing now. You know, celebrities, folks in, uh, um, in in the public eye are doing this more and more, and it just has a, a a big impact. Even even on me, the more people I see doing it, gives me the courage to to do it as well. Um, and the more people that I knew in recovery, the stronger my commitment uh, to recovery um, uh, grew. Personally, I think that you know government should always serve to to aid those least fortunate. I think there's always going to be a market, of course, for alcohol, just as there remains a market for cigarettes uh, and and other harmful substances, even with with all that we know about them. But our public dollars really should be going into prevention, uh, education, treatment, and and, and community engagement, um, just like this. And uh, with that, thank you all. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Seppala. Thanks a lot, Joe. I appreciate your introduction and, and your story. That was really uh, beneficial. And I'm sure that probably will have more people's attention than what I talk about. <laughs> but I'm glad to do so. Really happy to be here tonight and involved in this. Um. And I'm going to share my PowerPoint here. So I was tasked with talking about uh, what you need to know to discuss uh, alcohol and drug use with your children, with your kids. And um, and, and it's an essential uh, skill to have because our kids are faced with alcohol and drug questions and issues throughout their life, actually. It, it's astounding just how young the average age of onset of alcohol use is and, and cannabis use. And it's actually in the 12 to 13 year old age range. Uh, and so we have to be um, attending to this actually from a very young age to be sure that our kids are prepared for that because their friends are going to ask them about it and they're going to be faced with all kinds of issues that, that they need to have answers for and, and skills to address. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. Let's see. So one, one important feature of this is that, you know, parents always wonder, do I actually have any influence over my children's decisions? And there's been numerous studies uh, examining that very question about alcohol and drug use in particular, and the decisions children face. And and actually, parents have tremendous influence over these decisions and are crucial to uh, their understanding of this and the decisions that they're going to make. So even though we always think it's just their peers that uh, drive their decision making, that's not the case at all. Parents uh, have a 
tremendous role in this and and that's important to know um and intoxicants really do significantly alter brain function especially for adolescents their brains are growing and they don't um, mature until their early 20s uh females before males actually you know the uh, people born as uh, female sex are going to have matured brains in their real early 20s, like around by 21. But the guys, on the other hand, are going to be in the mid-20s, closer to 25 or so. And I certainly saw that with my son <laughs> and, and my daughter, where uh, she was the most organized person in the family, and, and he had difficulties until his mid-20s, and, and then just that took off. Um, and all of these substances are really powerful uh, in regard to altering brain function throughout adolescence if people start using. And, and one major factor is that the earlier onset of use of, of potentially addictive substances results in a higher risk of addiction. Um, because even if you don't have a genetic risk factor for addiction, which is the primary risk factor, if you start really young, they're powerful enough to alter your brain in a way to put you at risk. Uh, whether you had that risk in the first place or not. And th this uh, you know, brain scanning study is a, a bit of an old one, and it just shows the reward centers in people's brain. And the reward center is the part of the brain primarily responsible for addiction itself, not necessarily for the feelings of intoxication, although it has a role in that, but it has a the major role in addiction. And you can see on the left side there's um control subject it says at the top and that those are people who don't have addiction uh to these substances cocaine methamphetamine heroin and alcohol and you can see that their brains as scanned that reward center is really bright red inside the yellow and really lit up well while the people described as drug users here which is a or drug abuser which is an unfortunate term but was old and used in this study um they they don't have that much red left anymore and and that reveals a diminishment of a neurotransmitter called dopamine um the primary nerve transmitter involved in addiction not the only one but the primary one and it it, it provides uh, information for that part of the brain about the stimulus that the drug and its meaning for the person um, and the more it's used, the more these drugs are used, the, the more the brain has to respond to them because they are so powerful. They're overdriving act, normal activities in such a way that the brain cells, the genes in those cells alter what they produce. So the genes can produce proteins, so they'll, they'll diminish the number of proteins used for uh, receptor sites for these substances on each of those brain cells, resulting in uh, less um, attention to what's going on in regard to that that drug, or and all drugs, and actually all rewarding activities. Um, so the more one uses, the more one needs to continue to use to gain the same benefit from the drug, and the less the brain's going to respond to normal. Uh, stimuli that would usually result in, you know, joy and happiness and the sorts of things that we seek in our lives. And that's one of the major factors associated with addiction. Um, this reward center being downregulated, it's described, so that the person actually has to continue to use the drug to get the same benefit. Now, there's multiple risk factors associated with uh, substance use itself. This is not addiction. This is just leading to experimentation or initial use of these substances, especially among adolescents. And um, there's a lot of information here, so I think it easiest probably to go through it yourself. But you can see that these are. This is not about addiction. It's just what kind of things put your child at risk more, more more risk for use and you know abuse neglect maltreatment the uh poor parent child relationships conflict in the family you know if parent and fam family substance misuse itself can be 
uh, drive such thoughts and, and actions, uh, favorable parental attitudes about substance use. It's important to know what you're telling your children about this in regard to the risk of their own uh, interest in use and unclear expectations about substance use. We really need to set the expectation, which I'll talk about a bit later. There's social issues, like their peer relationships, especially if the, they're, they're with deviant peers already doing things that are problematic, like gang associations, even popularity seeking, because often people, especially in their teens, think that popularity is associated with doing the things most people do. And although most people don't use these substances, the perception is that most people do. And so it may be a popularity issue to use the substances. And then there's individual risk factors, mental health concerns, abuse of any kind, um, you know, favorable attitudes towards substance use among themselves and their peers. And then school performance issues are also part of this because it's the main task of an adolescent school itself. And so if you're not doing well in that setting, um, it's more likely that you're going to seek out substances or other other problematic uh, behaviors. And then communities. Interestingly enough, in Oregon, where we, we just um, recriminalized substances after Measure 110, uh, that laws and norms favorable for substance use actually result in more substance use by our youth. And, and that's a real problematic aspect of, of such uh, legislation. That, that we were, um, by voting in the decriminalization, we actually suggested to our youth less risk associated with these substances, especially since we don't really have prevention programs in, in the state, which uh, we're trying to address with this um, these presentations this evening. Risk factors that actually lead to substance use disorders, which when I say substance use disorders, that's the official sort of terminology in the United States in regard to uh, problems with substance use. And, and it's on a spectrum from mild to severe. And so what we're talking about here is addiction, and that's like moderate to severe substance use disorder. Uh, and I'd, li I'd like addiction as a better word for that, but it's not the official terminology anymore. Um, oh, and the primary risk factor for addiction itself is genetic. Uh, it, it counts for about 50% of the risk, um, which is always surprising to people. And, and in my family, I, I'm Finnish. I'm 100% Finnish. My mother immigrated. My father's parents immigrated from Finland. Um, and the Finnish government about 15, 20 years ago announced as the first country in the world uh, that the number one cause of death was alcoholism. You know, we beat the Irish. It's just uh, revealing the, the huge risk genetically that, that I faced, even though my parents didn't drink much and uh, didn't use other substances. And um, I started to drink at age 12, and by 15, I was using multiple substances almost every day, and I dropped out of high school at 17 and was disowned by my family shortly after. Um, fortunately, they got me into treatment before they disowned me because they relapsed afterwards. Uh, and that was at 17 after leaving high school. Um, and it turned out that I went to the Hazelton Foundation in Minnesota where I grew up and I was the first adolescent ever treated there in their system. And I didn't remain abstinent right after treatment, but I did um, get into recovery at age 19 and haven't used any psychoactive substances since. And as a result of that, I, I ended up getting an incredible job in a research lab at the Mayo Clinic, went on to college, two years into recovery, went back to Mayo for medical school, and then decided to go into this uh, as a specialty, so I became a psychiatrist and specialized in addiction. But the the genetic aspects of this put me at risk from the beginning. Something I didn't know, and nobody really knew at that point in in, in our history uh, of understanding addiction, addictive disorders. 
trauma and adverse childhood experiences are second on the list for risk factors related to addiction and mental health problems are third. Almost any mental health problem actually increases the risk for addiction, doesn't cause addiction, but increases the risk for addiction. As do you know, some of the behavioral and impulse control issues. People with uh, ADHD, usually identified in youth, but not always, um, if they have ADHD and it's untreated, they are at high risk for developing addiction. But if they have ADHD and it's treated appropriately, even with stimulant medications, they have a lower risk uh, than the norm uh, for uh, developing addiction. Again, I, I mentioned early age of use, early age of onset of the, the use of these substances is a risk factor for addiction, as well as the use of really highly addictive drugs. So when, when we hear about all the problems in downtown Portland and around the state, with methamphetamine and fentanyl, that, that's that's part of the issue here, that uh, these are extremely potent drugs and a higher percentage of people will become addicted to them than to other substances. So the main issue is having conversations with our children. And, you know, starting early is just essential. Um, and no one told me about this as I grew up. I had no clue. Uh, didn't understand it, didn't know anything about it, didn't know anything about alcoholism or drug addiction, didn't know I was at risk. Um, and it's important to start early enough that you proceed uh, the possibility that, that they're going to be getting into issues uh, with their friends and, and not know what's coming. And, and so you want to set them up uh, to make positive choices to really empower them and um refusal skills is a simple thing to start when they're very young you know that they can say no to their friends who want to take a toy away from them or they want to take their chair in the classroom or whatever that they can they can say no and then as they age that they can say no to other questions that their friends or other things their friends might ask them to do or that they really don't want to do um, and, and just empower them to be able to make positive decisions in that manner. Because at some point later, they're going to need that empowerment when they're faced with friends who ask them if they want to, you know, drink some alcohol or use some marijuana. And if they're used to saying no to their friends about the simple things, it makes it that much easier to say no to more difficult things like this. Uh, but also, you know, my children, I'm an expert in this and I, and I told my children, and I have this, you know, lived history as well. And I probably told my children a little too young about some of that. But I also provided them a degree of understanding from the science when they were quite young. And they made decisions together. I have two children. Uh, um, and they made decisions together that they weren't going to use uh, until they were out of high school and outside of the home because... It was so important to me as a person in recovery. Um, and, and they didn't really tell us that, although, you know, they, they had said they probably weren't going to use it, but they didn't tell us about their own conversations, which we were really proud to learn of at a later, later point. Um, but another way of going about this is to look for teachable moments. You know, when you have an example right in front of you, like if in your family you use wine or beer for, you know, at a dinner, at, at dinner some evening, it's a good opportunity just to discuss appropriate use of adult beverages. And, and using that terminology is also helpful, too, because it it places it in a way that they can understand it differently than you just have to wait till you're a certain age. You're 21. Um, you know, beer commercials, if you're watching sports or something, they're so common. And it, it offers an opportunity to discuss appropriate and problematic use of those beverages. And, you know, my son and his best friend and I were driving to a sporting event. I think it was in Eugene, going to a duck game. And um, they were both in junior high at the time, or, you know, middle school at the time, I guess. And uh, one of the blazers had just been caught at the airport with some marijuana. And he was a local guy, grew up in Portland, 
So he was really highly regarded and, and his career was kind of on the downswing. He wasn't playing as well. And it was becoming really curious what was going on. And he gets caught with marijuana at the airport, a, a very unusual thing to have happen and suggestive of not really thinking things through very well. Um, and they asked me about that because, you know, I worked in addiction and, um, and they were wondering what was going on. Now, most of the time, kids look up to athletes. And so, you know, the use of marijuana among athletes, you know, reduces the perception of risk among our youth. But in this case, it, it didn't necessarily do that, although they were curious. And, and when they asked me, it gave me an opportunity to talk about how his career had diminished, um, how he wasn't playing as well, and, and how that could be related to marijuana use. Because marijuana actually uh, overstimulates this sense of awe and wonder that we have um, in our brains. It, uh, uh, we have an internal cannabinoid system. We have these internal cannabis-related chemicals in our bodies that play a, essential roles in almost all physiologic functioning. And as a part of that, you know, when you first use marijuana, the first few times you might just find yourself completely taken with the, you know, the rainbow and the soap bubble in the sink when you're washing dishes or, the, you know, at staring at this gorgeous green fur in the backyard. Uh, all kinds of things like that get stirred up in, in unusual ways and significant ways. But if, And doing marijuana once in a while, you can maintain that experience over time. But using marijuana on a daily basis overdrives that system and the cells downregulate, as I was describing earlier. They are trying to keep normal function in place, we call homeostasis, and, and not have this overdriven over, you know, experience, uh, this really powerful experience. These cells just kind of want things to go along pretty evenly day in, day out. And when they're not, they've got to do something about it, and they do. And it, it removes that ability when people are not using marijuana. So life becomes boring, quite boring, in fact, uh, unless they're getting high. And then that sense of awe and wonder comes back. And part of awe and wonder is actually novel events. And if you're an athlete, especially a basketball player, and you're coming up against a guy that you've guarded, you know, you're playing defense, they're on offense, um, and you've done this, you know, let's say 50 to 100 times because you play each other multiple times per year. In general, if he puts on a new move, you could respond really well. But if you're smoking pot every day and you don't use the day of the game because, you know, it, it slows your reaction time a little bit, it also results in an inability to recognize that novel event that he puts this new move on and he's suddenly scoring and you're standing there looking at him. And I was able to use that example with those two. And they were really taken with that. And it was a teachable moment. It was just this opportunity to discuss something that otherwise, you know, if I just brought it up out of the blue, it could have been boring. Um, but they found it fascinating and, and, and saw a good reason not to use marijuana uh, at that point in their lives. And it's important to make your values and rules really clear about drug, alcohol and drug use and set expectations from an early age for what you want. And, you know, in our family, it was no use till you're uh, old enough. You're out of the house and, and you can make those decisions for yourself. Um, you also need to know the facts because they need accurate information and they can get all kinds of information themselves, good and bad off the Internet. So you need to have the, the, the real facts and provide that to the, your kids. And listening is so important because those two are talking about this guy in the backseat on this drive, and it opened the door for that conversation. And, and that's the type of thing that we need to do on a regular basis with our kids. Guidelines to help them, you know, help them strategize how to avoid alcohol and drug use with role-playing. You know, what would you do if... You know, your friend 
came up to you with a six pack of beer and you're, you know, you're 13 years old. What are you going to say? How are you going to react to that? You know, just putting them in, you know, making up different scenarios and brainstorming about options when faced with a friend that offers some drugs or alcohol, you know, what would you say? What would you do? What's a good response in those circumstances? How would you handle it? Um, establishing a code phrase. This is commonly used for any kind of emergency or urgent sort of situation to, to use this code phrase in a text or a phone call, you know, when under pressure, like someone's asking you um, uh, to get high with them. And, the, and there was an example of this recently uh, in, in the city of Lake Oswego where some, some girls had um, had an interaction with a father at, at, at someone's home that they found to be really uncomfortable. And, and one of the girls called her mother and did this sort of thing, which uh, is exactly what you wanna have done when they're facing um, really difficult circumstances. And you need to know your children, um, keeping track of them, where they are, when they're changing where they are, who they're with, how long it's gonna last, all those things. My wife was just has some supernatural power in, in, in this regard when her kids were growing up and they they knew that somehow she would know what they were up to. And it was almost always true. Um, and know your children's friends and their parents as much as possible um, so that you have some sense of who they're hanging out with and who those parents are. And, you know, don't want your children to be uh, faced with entering a another family's car when the driver's under the influence of alcohol and not have the ability to say, hey, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with this. I got to get out of here and have a plan for how to do that. Um, we need to be positive role models for our children. Uh, and that certainly includes use of psychoactive substances. And we need to keep talking with them and with their friends over time to be sure that we have open communication lines. It's good to start with the most common substances. You don't want to stop there in the long run, but that's the best place to start because they're always going to be faced with these things first, most likely. Um, and it just opens discussions for the other substances as well. So, you know, it's easy to talk about alcohol and how it affects judgment, increasing risky behaviors, and in particular for teens, it impairs driving ability. And um, only recently, overdose deaths among teenagers has superseded uh, the deaths by car accident for teenagers as the number one accidental cause of death. Um, so these, you know, car accidents, extremely problematic for our teens and um, tragic, and, and we need to prepare them for that before they get in those situations with friends or even on, you know, by themselves. Marijuana, I mentioned how it can cause boredom and slow reaction time and undermines responses to novel events in that example I talked about. It's important to tell our kids that, but also it causes short-term memory loss. It doesn't necessarily cause long-standing problems with memory. The uh, jury's still a little out on that one, but it's pretty clear-cut short-term memory loss is problematic. So it can absolutely and been proven to um, undermine school performance. Nicotine, you know, it's it's good to appeal to things that mean something to them in the moment um, for our children. So it smells on your clothes, your hair and your breath. It causes your teeth to go yellow and your fingers get yellow. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, cancer, emphysema, heart disease, the real... Uh, medical issues associated with it aren't going to get their attention as much, but they still need to know about those things. And don't neglect the other drugs over time. It, I don't have enough time to go into specifics about all of them tonight, but this is just a sampling of how to go about this. And when problems arise, because they're likely to, you know, our kids are risk takers and they're under pressure. Um, so when th these things come up, Remember that, that that is kind of a normal part of going through adolescence. So be supportive, stay calm, try to be non-judgmental. It's tough under these circumstances. Easy to get really scared. 
um, describe what you observed, be really specific about what you observed, you know, uh, you walked in, you were stumbling around, I smelled alcohol on your breath, um, your speech was a little slurred, that, that sort of thing, to really fully describe what, what, is, what you witnessed, and then repeat those family values, rules, and expectations. They need to hear it again. And if you've repeated it all along, it's not going to be a surprise that you're bringing it up again. Um, and state the facts about the use of these substances and the risks that they're taking. Uh, set the limits again, provide guidance, and then seek an expert for help if this continues. You know, the first time may not be the time to do that. It all depends. Um, if you have a strong family history for addiction, it may be a time to go in and talk to an expert. And don't assume that your physician or even a psychologist, a general psychologist knows much about addiction. You need to go to someone with expertise in addiction because it's not well taught in medical school or in PhD programs. Most counselors know very little about it and, and often think they do know a lot about it, unfortunately. So the signs of substance use are really hard to um, address in, a, in kind of a quick manner. You'll see these first, every, everything but the last two are changes that occur for all kinds of reasons in adolescence. Um, but if you see them kind of come together, even what reason, it may be something problematic. Um, and so you want to investigate and see what's going on. It could be substance use, you know, when they're changing friends without obvious reasons, dropping in grades, unexpected school absences, you know, they're no longer motivated about most anything, secretive and moody, isolating, all those things, changes in appetite and sleep patterns. You could see that from depression, from stress, you know, from just plain adolescence, some of that stuff. But if you're seeing multiple aspects of this, it's worth taking note. And, and especially if suddenly they're using air fresheners in the car or in their room and breath mints and perfumes to cover up smells, could be alcohol or, you know, smoking marijuana, uh, harder to tell if they're just taking gummies or something, uh, bloodshot eyes, pupillary changes, um, slurred speech, all these issues in coordination give you a sense of more of a higher likelihood of a substance use problem than just standard adolescence or depression or some other mood disorder. So in summary, uh, start early, really important to start early. Um, you, you need to have them prepared. And that, that's the, that's the major issue. Help them be prepared for this. Parents have great influence as the, as that first slide said, you know, we, we, we play a tremendously important role in this, um, an essential role uh, in establishing those values and rules and expectations because that sets the stage for them. They come to understand that this is what we do in our family. Um, and the primary risk factors for substance use disorders are the genetic makeup, trauma, and mental health problems. Um, but the genes are the overwhelming number one. So if you have addiction in the family, uh, it's essential that you do all these things we've been talking about because your child are at so much higher risk. And if you have a primary relative, like a first degree relative, so brother, sister, parents, uncles, aunts, grandparent that has a problem with addiction, you're six times more likely than the general population to have a problem with addiction. That's a huge increase in, in risk. And, and so the genetic piece is, is tremendously powerful. And if there's people in recovery or people still using in an addictive manner in your family, your children are at way higher risk and, and that needs attention. You know, consistent, consistent communication about all these issues is essential and, and help is available if and when problems arise. And that is it for mine. Thank you, Dr. Seppelin. That was excellent. Lots of great resources and tools there. 
We're going to move on now to Dr. Loeffler. Well, it's nice to meet you all. I, uh, again, I'm Moxie Loeffler. I'm the Oregon Medical Director for Community Medical Services. We are an opioid treatment program. We offer walk-in methadone and buprenorphine treatment six days a week. We just opened in Salem in November on Church Street, and we're going to open in Eugene and Portland fairly soon, which is exciting. Um, I am also the Oregon pub, uh, Public Policy Chair um, for the ASAM chapter, or SAM, and I'm on the ADPC. I'm a commissioner, Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. Um, and we have a lot of work to do in our state to increase the treatment network. So I'm really happy to be here tonight um, talking about preventing underage drinking. And we're going to be talking about how to lift that protective factor. So a lot of parents and teachers, family and friends don't really know exactly what are the most effective things we can do in our homes and also in public policy to protect young people. So um, I think of health as something that happens in a place. So it happens where we live, work, and play. Um, it's not something that's entirely uh, just free choice. Um, and I'm an osteopath. Uh, we, I would say the best way to summarize it is we do strength-based medicine, like finding what is strong and resilient about a person and how we can build that up in them. Um, I'm Buddhist, I'm bisexual, I don't really identify with gender, but you can call me she and her. Um, I'm white, I studied health equity at UC Berkeley, so it's a combination of various different um, areas in policy, um, statistics, epidemiology, and um, environmental justice at Berkeley Law School. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and I live in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I just have a quick quote to read uh, for you. It's by Curtis White. He's a social critic. So to frame this in terms of karma, um, often people think of karma as punishment, um, but the best translation of karma is probably cause and effect. And instead of thinking about karma only as an individual thing, there's also a karma of the collective. Personal decision making happens only within a larger karmic context. No one has to go to the trouble of inventing destructive ways of life. They are always already here waiting for every child. So um, I am not a person in recovery. Um, I did greatly reduce my drinking a few years ago because we have a family history of alcohol use disorder. And my son, when he was six, looked over at my glass of wine at dinner and said, get me drunk. And I said, oh, wow, <laughs> you're drinking. Genes are speaking. <laughs> um, so this is a picture here of my sister and I. Um, she was about seven or eight in this picture, and it was about two to three years later that she started drinking alcohol. My mother taught for decades um, alcohol and drug use prevention in middle school. So if there's anyone who could have stopped my sister, it would have been my mom. Um, and sadly, she uh, drank heavily, attempted suicide at the age of 15. Um, she was extremely gifted at math and art, and she um, went away to school in, it was a college for kids who hadn't finished high school because she was struggling so much where we lived. So she went to Massachusetts where there was a mass shooting at her school, and she um, there were five people shot. She dropped out of school, became homeless, lived in abandoned buildings for several years and would call me on the phone. Um, so I did my best to take care of her. She eventually uh, quit alcohol and she, she graduated with um, highest honors from New York University in uh, theoretical math. So a good ending to that story. Um, so youth alcohol use in the US um, is pretty prevalent. Um, in a 2022 survey of um, ages 14 to 15, about 20% of those that in that age group reported they'd had at least one drink in their lives. Um, and about almost 6 million youth between ages 12 and 20 reported drinking alcohol beyond just a few sips in the past month. So in terms of race and ethnicity, there's roughly equal prevalence of substance use disorders among different groups. Sometimes we see a little shift around age. So at 14, there's equal rates among white, black, and Hispanic youth of um, alcohol use. And then at age 18, there's a 
split and um, white and Hispanic youth are about twice as likely to drink alcohol compared with black youth. So in um, 2019, there was a report showing that Oregon ranked 12th for uh, past use, past month's alcohol use um, among people ages 12 and older. Um, binge alcohol use was pretty common in Oregon. We were ranked at 22nd um, in the United States with about a quarter of people ages 12 and older of reporting that binge drinking, which is heavy drinking. Um, the long-term trend is really favorable. You see a big spike in the older age group, um, ages 35 to 50 in 2020. So during the pandemic, there was a lot of pandemic uh, excessive drinking going on and daily drinking. Um, there, so if you keep in mind that overall there's a, been a pretty good decline in, um, in alcohol consumption um, since about 2009 among ages 19 to 30, um, then there's also lower uh, rates of binge drinking. That's been coming down since about, it looks like a peak of about 37.3% uh, in 2008, down to now 30.5%. Um, as of the time it was last measured about two years ago. The best upcoming data is going to be the Monitoring the Future study, which um, is going to come out in May. Um, but overall, there's been a decrease in um, daily drinking. So this slide should say, how can Oregon prevent or reduce underage drinking? Um, Role of prevention is you can look at the efficacy of prevention based on the um, cost benefit. So for every dollar spent, how much um, do we end up saving? So the most effective thing, if you look at this table, is the highest dollar amount, which is the good behavior game. Um, life skills training is pretty widely used as well. And um, basics is another program. So life skills is a three-year school program. Um, it showed delays in early use, meaning later onset of substance use. And it was still showing some efficacy about five years after the intervention. And then in Keeping It Real, they had a um, culturally sensitive model that was used among Mexican-American youth. And the good behavior game is for reducing aggressive and disruptive behavior, as well as changing um, risky behavior in general, including substance use. Again, the most effective intervention was the good behavior game, if you look at cost effectiveness for these different types of evidence-based interventions. The best article that I found was the one that's listed at the bottom of that screen. So um, physical and mental health are interconnected. And I, I like to think of it holistically in terms of all these different aspects. There's, you know, how are things going at home with money and finances, uh, with housing, with the school environment? Is there any bullying going on? Is the child developing intellectually? Um, are they getting the support they need at school? Um, how are things at home with um, emotional environment? Are, they, there's, are there fights at home? How, and how much stress are the parents under? Um, what, what kind of substance use uh, role models do they have at home? Are people using around them? Um, physical health is really important um, and can have a really positive or negative effect and peers, of course, as we've mentioned. Um, so the physical health impacts of alcohol are many. Um, alcohol can, is the third leading cause of preventable death in Oregon. Um, and the diseases often involve cancer, liver disease, um, diabetes, and alcohol dependence. Injuries are common related to alcohol use, um, not just crashes and um, accidents, but also violence. So um, suicide studies show that even those who don't chronically use alcohol have an increased risk of consuming alcohol just prior to death. So it's about a 1.8-fold risk for males and 2.4-fold risk for females. Um, alcohol has a, a negative impact on mental health in general in a lot of different ways, including anxiety and depression, um, social isolation, stress response, poor sleep. Oregon ranked pretty high for the prevalence of various types of mental illness, second for any mental illness in the past year, third for a serious mental illness, which was 7% of Oregonians affected, 
second for serious thoughts of suicide with almost 7% and fifth for major depressive disorder um, in the past year, almost 10% of Oregonians. So personal factors are really important. Dr. Sepala got into this a bit already. I would emphasize really um, social anxiety is really important. So people often use alcohol to cope with social anxiety and attention deficit disorder is treatable. And um, some people say, you know, ADD is overdiagnosed, but it's not overdiagnosed if your child has it. <laughs> so it's a really a wonderful thing to find and treat. And people who get treatment as teens and as children are less likely to develop substance use disorder. And as adults, about a quarter to half of people with SUD um, have ADD. So it's, it's a very high, uh, strong risk factor. But these children can do great with the right support. Um, people with a history of trauma, we already talked about a little bit. Um, people who are LGBT, um, it's very common for people to have um, SUD who are part of that population. People who don't really talk about their feelings um, or are passive and don't manage anger and impulses very well have trouble too. So um, self-care and coping skills are really important. Um, Sleep deprivation is a really, a really important thing to pay attention to in children, especially since um, the use of cell phones and computers has really skyrocketed among youth. So middle schoolers, um, about 57% didn't get enough sleep on school nights. And high school students, 72% um, didn't get enough sleep. This is a real challenge for high schoolers because their sleep cycle naturally shifts and they want to go to bed later and get up later. The school hours often don't coincide with um, the biological clock of a, an adolescent very well. So that's a challenge, but also getting that cell phone out of the kid's bedroom and getting the, um, maybe turn off the wireless and get the video games out of the bedroom and get them all shut down for the night is probably good. So recommended hours of sleep are shown on the right, six to 12 year old, that's nine to 12 hours a night. Um, 13 to 18, you want eight to 10 hours a night. I know we struggle with my older kid now. He wants to stay up later than my husband and I. It's really tough. <laughs> so um, less sleep can actually increase alcohol intake. Possibly that's a, it may be a causal relationship. Um, so it may protect someone just getting more sleep compared to less sleep. Um, getting less than six hours a night is, um, is associated with all kinds of increases in risky behavior. And self-care and coping skills, it's really important to be able to name your feelings because that can engage logical thinking and problem solving. Assertiveness and speaking up about needs in general is really important. So listening to your children when they try to um, maybe put up a fight or a debate with you, it might actually be a little bit helpful as hard as it can be. Um, advocating against bullying in schools and workplaces can be really important. Setting boundaries and feeling okay with not always pleasing everybody um, could be a really good skill for them to have. Exercise can increase people's uh, stress tolerance. So it can be a great part of distress tolerance training, especially for people with anxiety or histories of trauma. Exercise can lead to better sleep, especially if it's before 5 p.m. Um, and then better focus can happen from exercise with better studying, less uh, risk at school, and it can be a way of coping with ADD and ADHD. A sense of belonging and community, um, including neighborhoods and religion, uh, safety and survival are something that we get a sense of from uh, belonging with other people because that's how we all protected each other. So it's very ingrained. So one way to communicate about alcohol with youth is to look at the whereabouts guide. It's a brain development savvy tool to reduce high risk behaviors and you can find it online at the book. And then the NIAAA has a, a great website called Facts About Teen Drinking that you can uh, send kids to um, if they have questions and to find out whether they might have a problem. And parents can also stop drinking themselves so this is like what I did when I, I went from drinking a glass of wine with dinner every night to saying, oh boy, I don't think I want this around because my kid is starting to see it like product placement, you know, that we have, you know, we have alcohol in the house and that means it's fun. If, if my parents are, my husband doesn't drink, but if, uh, 
if my mom's drinking, then we know it's a party and that's what a real party is. So out the window it went. <laughs> um, so some resources for parents and guardians in case someone needs treatment are included below at um, findtreatment.gov. And you can type in your zip code and choose the type of insurance plan you have, like Oregon Health Plan or Medicare, um, whether you want inpatient or outpatient treatment, whether it's only substance use or also mental health, um, you can find it on find treatment and search within 100 miles of your home or so. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, and if you wanted to check out community medical services, if you know someone who has opioid use disorder, this is our website here at the bottom. And um, I think the rest of my slideshow is um, for the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Loeffler. That was a great presentation. And to Dr. Uh, Sepla as, as, as well. So much really good information there. And to everyone, I, I'm going to stay off my camera because we lost power here in LO, of course, on a beautiful night. Lord knows why. Um, <laughs> and I'm in the dark <laughs> and on a very unstable connection. So Elizabeth's going to pick up if I, I've been dropping in and out. I'm so sorry. Um, but let's start with... Um, we had uh, uh, a question from uh, an, an uh, attendee, what are safe ways to refer someone who is going uh, through um, uh, substance abuse? So I, I couldn't hear the first part to, to do oh, what? What is, what is a safe way to refer someone uh, that they know who, who is that they think is going through substance abuse? Um, you know, go ahead, Dr. Loeffler. Um, I would say that a lot of people want to get treatment in primary care. So uh, even though a lot of primary care doctors and NPs and PAs are not thoroughly trained in addiction, um, they're often very skilled at identifying resources in the community. Um, if the person doesn't have any trusted primary care um provider, you could try going to the findtreatment.gov website and um, look at what kinds of treatment the person is looking for. It might also help to have them call their insurance and ask if there's a case manager who could help them navigate that website. Because if they are not familiar with all the names of these programs, it might get overwhelming. I think um, the I think the group that put this together tonight for Clackamas County has a, a good list of um, resources as well uh, for the county itself. And there are, uh, as Dr. Loeffler and I are members of American Society of Addiction and Medicine, that, that's another way of identifying a physician that actually knows uh, addiction pretty well. Um, and, and there are, you know, it's, Sometimes just contacting treatment centers and asking them um, where they, you know, who they get to help them with referrals and how that works. Thank you both. You know, um, on a kind of a related question, somewhat, if a if a if a child, you know, comes to their parent and, and admits to experimenting with. Um, with substances, you know, what's, what's a, what, what's a good way to navigate a difficult conversation like that? You know, I, I had that one slide that, that showed a number of means of going about it. And, and, you know, the, um, the first thing is, is just not to be judgmental about the situation and try and uh, have a good discussion with them about it and but also to refer back to the expectations within the family itself and if they haven't been established before this happens that makes it a little bit more difficult in that you've got to not only address the issue itself but also really establish your your goals and values for the family at the same time um it's important to have some of the information about risk uh, that was discussed as well. Um, and there are great resources. Uh, Dr. Loeffler described a couple of the books she 
referenced is very good. Um, and the NIAAA's information is really solid stuff too. I imagine if um, if someone's child is 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 at least open enough to have that conversation, it's a good sign as well. That's yeah, absolutely. If a child comes to you and and admits that to the in in is seeking advice, that's a real open door, um, and they are concerned in some manner to do that. And um, for you folks uh, participating, if if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the in the in the, in the chat there, and we'll work to get them answered. But you know, um, uh, Doctor Cephala, again, sorry for you. Um, you know, we know that our, our behaviors are conditioned by our environment, and kids, of course, are influenced by a wide variety of of sources today. So, you know, how important is parental influence on underage drinking and does the influence pull more strongly one way or the other? You know, that is, does like a permissive household hold a stronger influence than a household working to kind of educate their kids on, on the dangers? Yeah, our kids certainly learn from us. I mean, we're the biggest and most common example they're going to have about what they do and how they see the world. And and so um, that example uh, needs to be considered uh, early on in our child's lives and how, how we'll do that in regard to these substances and, and, and what kind of messages will be sent to them. And, and it, I'm not saying that you shouldn't use substances. What I'm saying is to be really aware of how you use them around family members, especially children, because they're absolutely going to learn from that. Um, and they, they, they know way more than we think they do <laughs> about such issues and about our behaviors in particular. And they, they learn so much from us uh, that we, we have to be really aware of that and, and somewhat careful about it. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Loeffler, any thoughts you have about it? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that I try to do when I talk to my children is um, make it personal, you know, um, and if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to give someone advice, I mean, there's, there's a lot of advice in the world. <laughs> so, and a lot of the time when someone's struggling or they're exploring a health behavior, they don't really want advice. They often want to explore and understand what they're doing and make an informed decision. So if you if you have information and you feel it's really useful, it can help a lot to show respect to the person by asking permission before you give advice. So you could say something like, I'm glad you brought this to me. Um, you know, what is it that you're, where are you at with it right now? Do you feel like it's a problem or not? If it's a problem, why? Like, what is it you care about the most about what, your behavior? You know, what kind of consequence do you, are you most happy about, most unhappy about? Because if we just hit the door with advice, people often shut down and reject it. Um, and so it, it, they might not come to you the next time if we're all too forceful. Um, so it's an art of trying to manage our own stress about a child using substances and then balance that with, I'm glad that they came to me and there's some openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Mac. It typed in the chat the question I actually I was going to ask uh, next. So thank you, uh, Mac. Uh, and um, I was going to toss it to you, Dr. Loffer. This is I'm Mac says I'm always surprised by how much information kids consume and find online. How should parents, friends, family navigate the vast amount of information about drugs and alcohol that teens can find themselves, especially if it might not be factually true? Great question. Um, I think it's. It's pretty important, even though online sources are often misleading and can be really risky for individuals, that it's important to show respect for the story because for one person, that story is true, right? There's somebody out there, for instance, who quit using heroin, never took a medication, became a counselor, did great, has never looked back. That's not the common story and it's not the most uh, evidence-based approach to treating that addiction, but it's, I think, really important to show, um, to really honor that person that's sharing. So if, you're, if your child comes to you with some story and they say, um, 
you know, so-and-so said you can smoke cannabis every day and you'll be just fine in school and they're doing well and I'm not worried about it. You could say, gosh, that's curious. That's not what I've heard before. What have you heard? And you can use it as a chance to engage them, draw them out and go and look for quality information together and say, why don't we start from scratch and just say, what is it that we would look for to decide that a, a source of health information is reliable or not? And how do we take those stories individual people tell us and look at it against research and um, large associations of professionals and, and compare the advice that they're giving? Yeah. Thank you. you know, um, another attendee asked, what is the earliest age a parent, guardian, or an adult in general can start to talk to their child uh, to be uh, 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 to create awareness around substance abuse and and uh, alcohol use disorder? I, I'm a bit of an outlier here, but for me, it was in preschool when my kids were in preschool, which is uh, an interesting situation. I my younger child is now eight, and when he was three, two or three. He went to preschool and I found out at the end of the day, he had said, Prince died of a fentanyl overdose. And the preschool teacher came up to me and she said, he was talking about Prince today and about fentanyl. And I said, oh, you don't have to report us to CPS, to Child Protective Services, but if you have to, I understand. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, if you hear something that concerns you about the home, right? I'm thinking she's worried about my house. And she said, oh, no, it's okay. I thought it was just really impressive that he was aware of the issue. And I, so I think things have really changed compared to 10 or 20 years ago or when I was a kid about talking about substance use. And it was really a beautiful thing because a few days later, she thanked me and said, you know, I have opioid use disorder and I quit using oxycodone five years ago. And it was so refreshing to me to have a child bring it up. So. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Sepala, what do you have any thoughts on that question? Sure, yeah, somewhat similar actually. You know, most of the people who really deal in this area suggest starting between five and seven, if you can believe that, and and it does make sense. That it, but you have to do it in a real age appropriate manner. You don't don't want to shock them with things that they're not going to understand at all, um, and it can just be. Uh, setting norms for the family to start with and and, and that sort of thing um, and, and describing how as a parent what what you do with those substances and 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 maybe a little bit about you know the concerns related to them but that they're they're adult kind of use uh, substances uh, and, and setting that stage as well um, to help them over time, come to see that as something you do much later in your life, not not as a teen. Um, but then they also say between eight and ten, you really need to be sure that you've had these discussions because it's it's at shortly after that point that they're going to really be faced with these issues, and and maybe even by that point, um, depending on their friends and uh, the people that they're spending time with. So while yeah. earlier the better. Oh, sorry. yeah, yeah, earlier the better. I, I just wanted to add that my older son, I, I didn't approach it at all in that way, but my younger, my younger son is very adventurous. He's not afraid of anything, and he reads books about war and, you know, um, all kinds of things that would scare a lot of adults. <laughs> so I figured I, with him, I could tell him a lot. <laughs> I imagine, too, it's also, you know, better late than never as well, if there's folks here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and our uh, uh, last question here tonight, um, I have always, uh, and, um, uh, one of the attendees, I've always thought by setting expectations of no drinking that it encourages kids just to be sneakier. Now, a lot of people uh, feel that way. So I've struggled with how to go about this with my own kids. Do you think this is the case? You know, most of the people that really have an expertise in prevention and, and addressing these issues suggest having, you know, expectations for your family and, and, and in particular, um, pursuing postponement of use of these substances until an age where uh, it's going to be less problematic and less likely to uh, result in addiction. Um, and yeah, the, 
kids are, if they're going to pursue youth, they're usually going to be sneaky, independent of what you do or what you say. And it, so it's better to have had the conversations and really uh, establish your goals for the family um, than to uh, do the opposite, I'd say. Yeah, I um, I would say that I try to have the conversations with my kids so that they understand the risks and also what their peers might tell them about the substances. Um, and when I was talking about personalized risk, one thing that I, I have already talked to my children about is that we have a family member with schizophrenia. And so if you have schizophrenia in your family, using cannabis can precipitate the development of schizophrenia. There was a large study that came out recently in Denmark that showed that perhaps about 30% of cases of schizophrenia in young men could be prevented by avoiding cannabis. So although cannabis doesn't cause it in everybody and it's not gonna happen in tons of people, if you know that risk for yourself, that's different. And so you might say something like, some of your friends will do just fine, but um, for you, this is probably too risky. Mm -hmm. I know these are all, um, very difficult conversations, uh, to have. And, um, you know, I, I, I personally, myself, I don't have, um, kids, but I know it was really hard on my, um, uh, my family, uh, being able to, to learn about addiction and come to grips with one of their children, um, uh, suffering from it, even taking it as a kind of a personal, uh, failing. And so, I guess I would uh, encourage any parent out there to not, to not feel that way. I certainly felt a lot of guilt myself for my my parents putting them through that, and certainly wasn't their fault. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong, um, and um, there's um, despite all best intentions, you know, alcoholism is a is is is, a, is an awful uh, and very powerful uh, disease. And um, uh, oftentimes it can get a hold of someone, uh, no, no matter what you know level of prevention that goes into it. But but that certainly doesn't mean that these efforts are incredibly worthwhile. Being a loving parent, an open parent who can have these conversations with your kids, is just setting you all up for a great, healthy family dynamic. No matter what challenges um, you, you face, um, and I think we're going to kind of wind things down here. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Seppala, Dr. Lofter, and Bill Buck. Um, in addition to thanking our presenters, we want to recognize Pam Pierce, Executive Director of Communities Living Above, a substance use prevention coalition serving the communities of West Lynn and Wilsonville. Pam was instrumental in curing our speakers. Thank you so much, Pam. And we also want to recognize the Clackamas County Prevention Coalition Subcommittee that helped plan this event, Michelle Kutniak, Vibrant Futures Coalition, Ann Haynes, Oregon City Together, Jackie Jones, Candy Prevention Coalition, and my colleagues Elizabeth White and Trevor Higgins. Thank you, everyone.